It's an ordinary day in Iga Middle School and surprise, surprise, our main boy, Itokui Sakuraba, is blankly staring out the window, daydreaming. Suddenly, he catches a strange flicker of light emanating from a nearby building. He focuses on that glimmering object, trying to determine what it is. Before Itoki can, though, one of his classmates rats him out for snoozing in class. Itoki desperately tries to defend himself, but the teacher calls him to the front to solve the problem. The tattletale's face morphs into one of disappointment as he watches Itoki successfully answer the question. The teacher even jokingly comments about how Itoki should have gotten it wrong. When Itoki refutes this, the whole classroom bursts into laughter. After classes, Itoki's classmate, aka Mr. Tattletail, invites Itoki to hang out for a karaoke sesh. Now, Mr. Tattletail was a bit mean earlier, but what's a super tight friendship without a little squabble, right? Anyway, Itoki wants to join, but he just can't now. With his oh so jam packed everyday schedule, Itoki can't afford to waste time socializing. The boy has cram school six times a week and gymnastics three times a week, plus swimming and judo lessons. Do we need to mention the flower arrangement and dance classes he's supposed to have too? At least he successfully escaped those sessions. I guess loads of extracurriculars are the norm for kids from prominent families. A girl with flowing red hair seemingly tries to go in the same hallway as the group of friends. As soon as she spots Itoki, she quickly backtracks and hides in the corner. The girl overhears Itoki humbly mentioning that his family's only so-so financially. Arriving at their lockers, Itoki's friends still try to convince the boy to skip today's lessons. They use the typical yet compelling reason. You only get to be in middle school once. Might as well make happy memories. We've definitely heard these words at least once in our lives. Such words would normally change any busy person's mind, including Itoki. He exclaims his approval of the hangout, but then spots Kosetsu, his childhood friend, creepily peering through the lockers. Startled, Itoki promptly takes back his statement. On the way to his lessons, Itoki calls Kosetsu out for her actions, having enough of her stalker-like behavior. She responds that she has no reason to walk with Itoki, coldly mentioning that she's only there to ensure he doesn't skip his lessons. If not for Itoki's mom, Kosetsu wouldn't be playing babysitter right now. After finishing his gymnastics class, Itoki contemplates his gymnastic teacher's offer to pursue the sport in high school. With enough effort, Itoki could become a pro athlete in the future. Future. What prospects does Itoki plan for himself anyway? Before thinking more about it, he realizes he's already terribly late for cram school. No need to fret, as Itoki takes a little shortcut, parkour style. Itoki would have arrived earlier had it not been for the speeding car swerving directly toward him. Thank heavens for all that time in gymnastics, as Itoki expertly glides up a lamppost and backflips away from the crashing vehicle. The car seems to have busted its tires, by the looks of it, and so everyone gathers to help the driver. A certain someone is also amongst the crowd. The redhead girl from school manages to witness Itoki's neat parkour tricks. Meanwhile, at Itoki's family store, a customer complains about having bought veggies with bugs. The only problem is that she's ranting to Tokisa Dakaga, Itoki's uncle, who happens to be clueless about customer service. The old lady is beyond irked with Tokisada. Tokisada's single word replies of, uh-huh, and, oh. When Tokisada tells the old lady about bugs being delish when deep-fried, he's met with a smack to the head by Mr. Kozo. Dragged to the back room, Tokisada tries to defend himself by pointing out how the old lady was their usual complainer. Although Mr. Kozo's aware of this, Tokisada's approach could have been better too. Before the man earns another round of ear lashing, the store's manager and Itoki's mom, Yumika Sakuraba, arrives to tell Tokisada he can take the day off and fetch Itoki from cram school. That night, Tokisada teases Itoki about getting a moped license as soon as he reaches high school. Well, Itoki didn't ask to be picked up in the first place, but you know, mothers and their my word is law attitude. After Itoki shares his near-death incident earlier, Tokisada is amazed how Itoki still manages to attend cram school after such a horrendous experience. Well, Tokisada does have a point. I'd sure be crying on my way home if it were me. As soon as Yumika arrives from work, Itoki instantly helps her make dinner. Itoki then suggests he start working part-time to ease his mom's financial burdens. To this, Yumika reassures Itoki that they can still live on his dad's life insurance. Still not buying it, Itoki tries to persuade his mom to diminish the number of his after-school lessons. Nope, Yumika doesn't see the point of quitting now, kinda sad for Itoki though. It's pretty clear he wants to enjoy being young. But Yumika ultimately says that youth is only temporary and that education is for a lifetime. The next day, Itoki makes a stop at his locker where he's surprised to see an envelope with a heart on it. What's this peculiar little thing? Is probably the query going through Itoki's mind right now. He acts shy about it, practically slamming his locker shut the moment Kosetsu passes by. As soon as the coast's clear, Itoki opens the love letter. 
some girl has a crush on our protagonist, who's in utter disbelief. This girl is the mysterious redhead, Satomi Tsubaki, a second-year student at Iga Middle School. She confesses to watching Ituki all this time, developing feelings for the boy along the way. She details how Ituki stands out even when he tries not to. Plus, he's super smart. Satomi then mentions the incident Ituki managed to dodge, narrating how awesome he looked with his parkour skills. Upon reading all this, Ituki humbly denies being such a person Satomi earnestly described. Looks like Satomi isn't one to be dissuaded that easily, proudly proclaiming her intentions of dating Ituki. We can't blame the boy for having such an innocent reaction though, he's only starting to experience the dating scene. At home, Ituki immediately tells his mother about his plans for next Sunday. Technically, he only informs Yumika of skipping gymnastics for a school seminar. But Yumika sees through Itoki's little white lie and asks if he nabbed a girlfriend, noting how much of an open book her son is. At dinner, Yumika interrogates Itoki about this supposed girlfriend. It's quite an unexpected occurrence, and Yumika theorizes it wasn't Itoki that initiated the first move. To this, Itoki immediately confirms. Yumika then bombards Itoki with all her questions. How does Itoki know the girl? Through cram school? Gymnastics? Why did Itoki decide to date her? Is she cute? Upon Upon learning that Itoki doesn't really know Satomi, Yumika's whole demeanor instantly changes. Itoki catches on to this and tries to explain how things are finally starting for him. He pleads with his mom to allow him to go on a date next Sunday. However, Yumika's cold, monotone no echoes throughout the room. Still, Itoki tries to persuade her further, only to be met with another scathing reply. You can't date that girl. Yumika justifies that dating someone Itoki had never even talked to would be unfair to the girl. A bit old-fashioned for sure, but Yumika's disapproval is already set in stone. And you know, no, moms. It's pretty hard to convince them once they've already made up their minds. Infuriated, Itoki slams the table and stands up to leave. The next day proves just how kids always find ways to get what they want. The sneaky Itoki connives Tokisada into vouching for him. Meeting up with Satomi, Itoki asks where she'd like to go. Before he could think of anything though, Satomi asks if Itoki's fine with going to her place instead. Although Itoki's astonished by Satomi's suggestion, he doesn't really find the gall to say no. I mean, it's his first date. How could he say no to such an enticing offer? And that's how Itoki ended up at the Tsubaki residence, inside Satomi's room. After some time of the two awkwardly sitting beside each other, Itoki breaks the silence by asking if Satomi wants to watch TV or play rock, paper, scissors. Seriously? Rock, paper, scissors? Satomi doesn't seem to have heard a word Itoki said, and she unexpectedly stands up to remove her dress. Now profusely blushing, Itoki quickly covers his eyes with his hands and asks Satomi to put her clothes back on. But for some reason, this girl is as brazen as a bull, and she virtually throws herself at Itoki. Now perched on top of him, Itoki can feel every lady bit Satomi has. Not that he's not down for some action per se, Itoki's just not mentally prepared for such activities. I like you, senpai, Satomi declares as she inches her lips towards Itoki's. You'd think Itoki would let his libido take over, but this boy is one true gentleman. He quickly pushes Satomi off him, standing up in defensive mode as he tries to reason that they've just met. Wanting to alleviate the mood, Itoki asks if this is all a prank. Itoki's words are cut off when he checks under the bed to find a person with red eyes and a full cover suit. What's worse than seeing a stranger under your first date's bed? And oh, to get slashed in the face by the same girl. The suited person comes out and is joined by two more people. Itoki is beyond confused now, especially after he hears Satomi curse him to death. In a surprising turn of events, a smoking explosion creates a distraction. It's Kosetsu. She's here clad in a black full-body suit similar to that of the enemies. Kosetsu quickly grabs Itoki, manhandling him as she attempts to dodge the incoming enemies. As Satomi joins in the combat, Kosetsu has no choice but to throw Itoki out the window fiercely instructing him to run away. Before he can land on the ground face first, a makeshift cushion suddenly appears and drops Itoki in it. Someone rushes to grab Itoki and take him to a car. As they escape the scene, Itoki realizes that it's Miss Reha and Mr. Kozo both donned in the same suit as Kosetsu. Mr. Kozo tells Itoki not to worry about Kosetsu and that they will take him somewhere safe. That is, if they can manage to escape the car trailing them, the enemies auto-releases smoke and heaps of sharp star-like weapons, bursting the tires of Mr. Kozo's vehicle. This causes them to swerve, sway, and finally crash on the open highway. Itoki wakes up to Miss Reha commanding him to leave the premises and head toward town, where it should be crowded. Arriving at the place, it's already dark, with only the streetlights brightening the area. Itoki's now worried about how there's not a single person in sight. It's as if this ghost town is all a planned scenario. Proving this theory correct, the lights start to flicker and then promptly turn off. Every. Single. Street light. A police officer suddenly appears and approaches Itoki. A relieved Itoki starts explaining his current situation to the officer from beginning to end. Taking in the tale, the cop asks Itoki to calm down, sharing how a transformer is currently being installed, hence the power outage. Itoki's appeasement doesn't last long, however. Without warning, one of the bad guys holds the officer captive and easily slits his throat in front of Itoki. Mortified, the boy tries to back away, only to be smacked by another assailant. 
Itoki is now tied up and beaten around by the assailants. Tears start to form as he closes his eyes, fearing for dear life. Just as Itoki thinks his luck has run out, Tokisada reveals his presence, calmly smoking his usual cig. Tokisada jokingly asks Itoki how his date went, did the boy secure at least a kiss? The assailants are frantic upon seeing Tokisada, who's called by a mysterious moniker, Demigod. Tokisada then grumbles about the job, pointing out the officer won't be paid overtime by playing dead on the ground. Yup, the officer is all part of the whole drama bonanza. In the velocity of light, Tokisada disappears from their sight and is now crouching by Itoki. The assailants are baffled by Tokisada's speed and begin launching their attacks. Tokisada transforms into his suit and, in the blink of an eye, defeats every single enemy present. Itoki awakes once more, but this time from sleeping on Kosetsu's lap. Tokisada informs Itoki that they've arrived at their family home. Now even more confused, Itoki is seated in the middle of a room surrounded by familiar and unfamiliar faces. Miss Reha announces the village chief's arrival, enticing everyone to bow down. The village chief is none other than Yumika his very own mom. Straightforward as ever, Yumika finally lets Itoki in on their family secret, their Iga village's very own shinobi clan. Itoki realizes that his mom just said shinobi, as in ninjas. Ninjas, who came into being a few hundred years ago, have survived under various guises. With loads of villages scattered throughout the country, the members pursue regular jobs to blend into society. For Iga village, it's the service area. Yumika continues to explain how ninjas follow strict rules to avoid inter-village quarrels, but it seems the strongest village, the Koga village, has been trying to shift the balance. With Koga village's tremendous wealth and modern ninjutsu, they've been plotting to take over Iga village. Itoki's assailants must hail from this area, Yumika deduces. To further complicate things, Itoki here is the 19th legitimate successor to the distinguished Iga ninja lineage. Everyone starts bowing down to Itoki as soon as Yumika blurts this out. This is why Yumika's been strict with Itoki's lessons, to prepare him for his destiny, specifically, the future of becoming a ninja and the next village chief. Although Itoki straight out refuses, Yumika emphasizes that he already possesses the basic skills needed from a ninja. With Koga openly announcing war, Itoki must protect himself by improving his skills further. However, Itoki really isn't set on becoming a ninja. He can't even wrap his head around the fact that they exist to begin with. Now he has to become one? Mr. Kozo politely interrupts the argument between mother and son, stating how the Koga ninjas are just waiting for a window of opportunity to end Itoki's life. To this, the heir to the Iga clan suggests they call the police instead. This would have been a stellar idea. If it weren't for the fact that they're up against literal ninjas. Form your resolve, Itoki, Yumika's words echo in the boy's ears, snapping him out of his daze. Before the discussion can continue, Tokisada drags Itoki out to talk. You'd think Tokisada would also persuade Itoki to follow through with his predestined future, but he actually gives Itoki a chance to choose if he wants to become a ninja or die. Frustrated, Itoki berates how he can't just make a major decision in a snap. Especially after a horrifying near-death experience, no one can blame this poor kid. Life was normal yesterday, but he's the heir to a ninja clan all of a sudden? If he's not satisfied with the two options, then a third one exists. Tokisada offers to help Itoki escape until the heat dies down. Apparently, Yumika has ordered Tokisada to run away with Itoki if that's what he desires. Assuring the boy he's not the one to blame, Tokisada instead criticizes the Iga ninjas that were supposed to keep Itoki in the dark and well protected. Yumika only wants her son to be able to choose the life he wants. When Itoki's dad, the former Iga village chief, passed away, Yumika became chief as Itoki was only a kid then. Even though she isn't a ninja, Yumika has been protecting the village since then, filling in a role she didn't even want in the first place. What Itoki has been through is valid but likely incomparable to the heavy pressure Yumika has endured all this time. Having faced a world of death and deception, she continues to shoulder all duties and responsibilities by herself. Through all this, she's telling you it's okay to run away, Tokisada calmly says, indirectly meaning, your mom loves you and will continue to sacrifice herself for your own happiness. It's unfair, Itoki realizes. Tears begin to fall from Itoki's eyes, with the boy caught between a rock and a hard place. Even if he wants to run away, he can't bear the thought of leaving his mom alone. Screaming, Itoki now knows what his answer should be. Meanwhile, at a hideout where Satomi resides, an informant tells her about Itoki's current whereabouts. They can't touch him when he's in the Iga village estate, as it's too risky. A fear Satomi knows they can't go home without results, as they'll be expelled for their incompetence, or worse, they'd be disposed of. Hellbent on making Iga pay, Satomi vows to do whatever it takes to annihilate Itoki. At the Koga village's conference room, Hosen interrogates Mr. Enbi about his subordinates attacking Iga. Hosen, Koga holding sales director,
director, is worried about the National Ninjutsu Security Measures Committee, catching wind of and promptly investigating them. The two prominent members start a heated argument. Hazen is opposed to the ongoing recklessness while NB remains compliant to his terms of revenge. Yup, you heard that right, revenge. Koga Village wants to avenge their former chief, who presumably died at the hands of the Iga villagers. Acting chief, Kido Minobe, calls order on his quarreling members. There's no reason to fret when right now, Koga is strong and Iga is weak. What they can do though, is choke the life out of them at their own leisure. Let Koga's money and influence gradually shatter Iga's inferior status. The next day, Miss Reha presents a tablet in front of Itoki. Presently, the young master can't go to school, not when ninjas want to chomp his head off. In the meantime, Itoki will be attending Kokuten Ninja Academy. Kokuten Ninja Academy is Japan's only national ninja school, located in an area hidden from the public. Here, future ninja candidates work on their training and studies. Through intensive training, students even learn core values, like the importance of friendship. Well, to all ninja hopefuls out there, the principal is waiting for your admission. For a fake video, it sure is well made, but strangely, there are no actual ninja elements. Looks like Itoki is expecting some major action and lively sparring sessions. Surprisingly, the video is very much real for the whole world to see. Miss Reha says posting it online is exactly why no one would think it's genuine. The school's pretty much a safety net for Itoki since non-ninja students will find it hard to sneak in. There are also student dorms inside. Most importantly, the school operates under NSC's jurisdiction. All Itoki's gotta do is pass the transfer admission exam in two days. Yup, in two days' time. They wouldn't even know their exam site until the day of. Meanwhile, at the Iga store, Yumika's marketing their cakes to customers when Hosen comes forth to discuss business matters. Apparently, Ninman Confections is increasing the wholesale price. Mr. Kozo doesn't seem to believe it since they've been great friends with Ninman Confections. Hosen clarifies that Ninman has become Koga holding subsidiary, earning a frustrated reaction from Mr. Kozo. Why would Koga buy out their business partners to pressure Iga Village? This doesn't seem to adhere to NSC's laws at all. Upon hearing this, Hosen matter-of-factly informs Yumika and Mr. Kozo that the NSC has already Already reviewed the buyout and given their go signal. Yumika has no choice but to accept Koga's terms, looking forward to their continued business dealings. Mr. Kozo doesn't hide his disapproval, but Yumika only wants what's best for the factory workers. What a bunch of fakes! During dinner time, Itoki asks about his father. Based on what Yumika told Itoki, his dad died due to an accident. The question is, was it because he was a ninja? Itoki has been anxious about whether he'll become one in the future. The day of the transfer exams finally here. Tokisada will be driving Itoki and Kosetsu to the exam location. They'll need to wait since they have yet to announce the site. As they stand by for the exam location announcement, Itoki voices his woes to Tokisada. Is it really fine to take the exam unprepared? Itoki asks about ninjutsu, like breathing fire or manipulating water. Fire Style jutsu wata! Water style jutsu wata! Tokisada and Kosetsu are both stunned by Itoki's words. Oh, this poor innocent boy! Lighting up his sig, Tokisada jokingly calls this fire technique. Kosetsu, on the other hand, grabs Tokisada's coffee and pours it onto his sig, calling it the water technique. Tokisada then gets a call informing him of the exam location. Label it coincidental or not, but the place is at Koga service area. They sure are audacious. But according to Tokisada, Itoki won't die at all because it's forbidden to kill other ninjas. Very comforting in Indeed. Curious? Itoki asks why most ninjas work at service areas in the first place. The answer is pretty clear. Major roads have long been key in the flow of info and goods. Itoki and Kosetsu then head inside the service area. Sensing no danger, Kosetsu tells Itoki to ask the worker where the ninja aisle is. Soon as Itoki asks, the worker's perky nature changes, and she leads the two toward a room. They're instructed to go straight and all the way to the back. They arrive in another room where other prospective ninjas are waiting. The instructor then arrives and informs the examinees of the test details. They'll be taking a mock ninja ninja practical exam of hide and seek, in which they'll split into hiders and seekers. The hider will first leave the back room and hide within the service area. After a minute, the seeker will go outside and the exam begins. Both examinees will have 10 minutes to complete their tasks. Hiders who aren't discovered during that time pass the exam. In contrast, seekers who find and touch their hider pass the exam. Either way, only one of the pair can successfully go through. They're also monitored by security cameras. If their conduct proves to be prohibited by the ninja ordinances, they'll be disqualified ASAP. Now it's time for Itoki turn, his hider is going to be a girl named Maiko Yasukawa. Bidding Itoki good luck, Maiko suddenly reveals her face to him. Hence boy, is Itoki shocked to see that Maiko is in fact Satomi. After a minute, the instructor commands Itoki to begin the exam. But Itoki seems to be glued to the ground right now. He can't seem to move his feet. He knows bad things are going to happen once he leaves that door. Eventually, Itoki does go out to scout the area for Satomi. While he's busy searching, a guy holding a knife tells Itoki. Obviously, this guy's from Koga and is in cahoots with the girl. Luckily, Toki Sada shows up, immediately confiscating the knife and choking him until the guy faints. Itoki's search leads him outside. Kosetsu, in disguise, casually approaches Itoki. They better feign ignorance, or else both
both of them will be disqualified. Kosetsu informs Itoki that other Koga ninjas have managed to sneak in. Itoki wants to run away at this point, but Kosetsu tells him not to do so. He'll surely fail and won't be granted admission. It's a hard knock life. Everything will be fine. Oops, I shouldn't have said that so soon. A laser-like attack is suddenly fired, popping a kid's balloon and ruining someone's backstrap. Kosetsu is quick enough to get Itoki behind her as she spots a Koga ninja with Heat Haze 3 technology from nearby. The enemy suit is basically the chef's kiss when it comes to camouflage. Kosetsu then leaves Itoki to try and catch the Koga ninja. She promptly finds Satomi outside the girl's bathroom. Changing into her ninja suit, Kosetsu then tries blocking Satomi's attacks. With Satomi's next level suit, Kosetsu is at a major disadvantage. Two more Koga ninjas appear, making it possible for Satomi to escape and head straight toward Itoki. A camouflaged Satomi instantly spots Itoki standing inside the service area, and she jumps through the racks to get to Itoki. However, before she could reach the boy, he maneuvers a fire extinguisher and yells, FIRE! Yup, Itoki's master grand plan. Itoki then rings the fire alarm, prompting the customers to hastily leave the premises. He's also managed to tape some burning material on the bottom of the sprinklers. Fire and water technique activated. The sprinklers go off, frying Satomi's suit and revealing her location. This doesn't stop her from unleashing her sharp weapon as she beelines toward Itoki. Before Satomi can plunge her weapon through Itoki, Kosetsu arrives in the nick of time. Kosetsu lands a swift and forceful kick on Satomi, rendering the latter weakened on the ground. NSC police then arrive to arrest Satomi. She's going berserk with her obsession with killing Itoki, swearing profanities at the boy. The instructor then arrives to tell Itoki that the exam actually ended by the time he activated the sprinklers. Well, at least Itoki's still breathing. The instructor then asks why Itoki executed such an attention-grabbing plan, as there are other ways to counter optical camouflage. Ninjas should draw as little attention as possible. I don't want anyone else involved, Itoki explains as he remembers all the people that could get hurt because of him. Heading home, Tokisada is sure that Itoki failed, so he'll have to hide until the next exam. Iga does have an uninhabited island with zero infrastructure about four days away by boat. However, there's no way Itoki could go through with that. A phone call rings, interrupting Tokisada's words. And you won't believe it, Itoki here actually passed the exam. Looks like he won't have to go to that uncharted island after all. Still, he isn't sure if he feels happy or not. It's hard for him to parse, but one can only hope that he'll finally know once he gets a feel of becoming a true ninja. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.